you're watching Backyard Tech. Coming up this week, a World Heritage listing for a site in Victoria, a major bank stuff up, six buses targeted in a nasty incident, trouble with Melbourne beggars, a pioneering medical story and an international criminal won't come back to Victoria. This is the weekly wrap up, the other news stuff from Backyard Tech. Morning all, welcome to this week's The Weekly Wrap Up, the other news stuff and some other stories that I've followed throughout the week this week and uh, I've got to tell you, it's been a busy news week, there's been a fair thing, a fair few stories I've, I've looked at through the week but these are the ones that I really wanted to cover this week and that last tab you see up here, I've got an opinion about that um, and uh, frankly I find the, the person absolutely gutless over not just the act, but the fact that he won't come back to Victoria. We'll get to that story shortly. First up, though, you can see here, site in Victoria, older than the pyramids, has been added to the World Heritage List. And this has been a decades-long struggle and um, absolutely fantastic uh, news for that area, southwest Victoria. They do get a lot of tourists down there, but they make sure the tourists don't destroy the area. Um, a site in Victoria that's older than the pyramids, the Acropolis and Stonehenge has won world heritage status. The Budgie Bim cultural landscape in southwest Victoria became the first in Australia to receive world heritage protection solely for its Aboriginal cultural importance. It was added to the UNESCO World Heritage List at a meeting in Baku, Azerbaijan on Saturday following a decades-long campaign by traditional owners, some of whom were present, present for the announcement. The site was created about 6,600 years ago by the Gundich Mara people and is considered to be the world's oldest freshwater aquacultural system. It's absolutely fantastic, not just for the fact of it it's now World Heritage listed and not for the fact it's here in Victoria, but for the landowners, it means that the site cannot be destroyed. So international developers hoping to buy up the site and wipe it out, can't touch it. Absolutely fantastic news for both Australia, the state of Victoria and the traditional landowners. Brilliant. Um, I'll leave a link in the description below today's video for you guys to go and read the full articles yourself, but absolutely great, great news. Um, the system includes stone channels, weirs and dams, which were built to bring water to and young eels from the creek to low-lying areas. Absolutely fantastic. Brilliant. Really, really good, that one. So that, uh, that was one story I followed this week. This one is... Oh, unbelievable. One of the big four banks here in the state of Victoria, the NAB. Let me just close that off and rewind that because that should have paused. There we go, pause that. The NAB... Oh, Nine's website gives me the ear. It's the... Um, I'll get there. <laughs> there we go. No, that's not right. I'll get pinged for that one as well. There we go. That's got it. Okay. <laughs> the NAB, the National Australia Bank. Now, the big four banks aren't really looked at as uh, trustworthy these days, and the NAB's gone and made a what could be best described as not just a catastrophic mistake, but a very distressing mistake. The NAB sends a Melbourne man a credit card for his dead wife. This, is, this was utterly unbelievable. A widower has received a credit card with his dead wife's name on it from the NAB. Bob Hart was sent the card in the mail as well as having her name printed on it with the word deceased, D-C-S-D, -D, on it. So it had his wife's name, surname, and then D-S-C-D. Um... How could the bank do that? Oh, sorry, DECD. How could the bank do that? The NAB is investigating and offered their sincerest apologies. The, 
I don't would you call this just out and out greed by the bank? How does that happen? This poor widower lost his wife and the NAB sent out a credit card. Did set in the Fed Income Department. I was I was absolutely blown away by that one. That was just utterly inane. And that just shows you what the banks can be like. Now I'm not one I'm not with one of Australia's major banks. I refuse to be with actually five of Australia's major banks. Um, one of them based here in Victoria. Because this sort of stuff can happen. Yeah, you know, the banks have just gone through the Royal Commission. They've said they'll change their ways. They still go ahead and send this poor widower a credit card with her name and then DECD at the end of it. What were they thinking? Actually, I've just said bank and thinking in one sentence. That's a bit of an oxymoron, isn't it? <laughs> that one, absolutely unbelievable, that one. This one is utterly horrific and they're looking for the people that did this this is from um 3aw um six buses targeted in slingshot attacks in melbourne's east and this is horrific ball bearings were fired at buses in six separate slingshot attacks in melbourne's east on tuesday a bus driver aged in his 60s was struck by one of the ball bearings which smashed a window and hit him in the head at about 3 20 p.m the bus was carrying six passengers at the time. Thankfully, the driver was able to pull over the bus safely. Um, look, I'm going to put this out there and please comment back. Okay? Why would you do that? Can, can someone answer that question with regards to this story? Why would you do that? What is the point? Other than seriously injuring someone, causing one hell of a prank. You've got to think about it. You're talking about a rat race bus or track bus, whatever you want to call it. That's 15 tonne of metal engine transmission, the whole lot. That can create chaos and mayhem. Why would you do it? Um, six buses were damaged in six similar attacks around Mount Waverley over a two-hour period. Senior Sergeant Foote said the incidents which occurred on Huntingdale Road between Solomon Street and Waverley Road, hell, I know where that is, could have had catastrophic results. Quote, potentially if a bus driver crashes, collides with another car or suffers serious injuries, it has the potential for serious consequences. It's concerning given the random stupid nature of it. Police are hunting for the perpetrator or perpetrators. Please, can someone who's got more intelligence than old mate answer me, why would you do that? Seriously, why would you do that? Please, someone answer. I'd love to know why. Because dead set, that is stupid. And that's probably... A worth old mate giving himself his own backyard tech channel medal of the master of understatements but not quite there so that one actually was horrific and i've been following along with the investigation into that um this is absolutely horrific now i can't speak for the rest of australia and i'm not intending to but i'm going to talk about this from both a melbournean point of view i'm a proud melbournean remember we are some of the most generous people in Australia. And this has come up. Now, I don't want to seem racist about this, but this is utterly... Her I don't think I can describe it. I'm going to read this whole story. Okay? I felt sick. Homeless champion reacts to FIFO beggar scam. 
Salvation Army Major Brendan Nottle says he felt physically ill when he discovered beggars unmasked as scammers in Melbourne's CBD. Authorities have told the Herald Sun undercover police swooped on the fly-in fake beggars in recent weeks, seizing more than $1,000 that they believe was going to be electronically transferred back to China. Several people have been charged on summons with begging and dealing with the proceeds of crime. But Mr. Nottle says they only make up a small minority of people genuinely pleading for help in Melbourne streets. I've been here for 17 years working in the city with the Salvos and I've never seen anything like this, he told 3RW Breakfast. I actually felt sick. Now, these people had clothing done up to look tattered, to look shabby, the whole lot. And they are professional beggars. Melbourne's homeless problem, I can't speak for the rest of Australia, okay? I'm not intending to speak for the rest of Australia. Melbourne and Geelong's homeless problem is a real big problem here in the state of Victoria. It's a huge problem, okay? We have a lot of people sleeping rough. Here you have a bunch of fly-in, fly-out, professional beggars who are actually very well off. They had return tickets paid for. Melburnians are generous, but you can't do that. That's just... The, the report I saw on the news was, and I couldn't actually find it from National 9 News' website or anything, so I've, I've pulled it from 3AW instead. It's, it's horrific that, that these people would have the, the gall to go to Melbourne CBD and look like they're in trouble, but the arrest showed, you know, they had full flight tickets booked. They were EFTing money back to China. That is just disgusting. Utterly disgusting. Chinese fraud prey on our goodwill police claim. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. I've got to tell you, my father, my late father, who was somewhat reasonably racist... If he was alive today and he saw this, I can lay you London to a brick. He would absolutely have flown off the hammer about it. He would have absolutely dead set in the Fed Income Department, chucked a massive tanty. He would have been going dead set off his rocker about it, I've got to tell you. Um, Dad was, unfortunately, fairly racist. This is a phenomenal news story, and this, make, this should make all us Victorians feel very proud because in a lot of ways, Melbourne Medical Research leads the world in a number of areas in medical research, and this is fantastic. Now, I saw this on National 9 News, couldn't find it, so I've pulled it from The Guardian here in Australia. Um... And I've got to say, this is just utterly brilliant. Pioneering surgery brings movement back to paralysed hands. Melbourne-based Natasha Van Zyl has treated 13 young adults with nerve transfer surgery. 13 young adults who were paralysed in sporting or traffic accidents have had movement in their hands restored through pioneering nerve transplant surgery, enabling them to feed themselves, hold a drink, write, and in some cases, return to work. Natasha Van Zyl, the Melbourne-based surgeon who leads a research program that has given some people their lives back. Um said that patients were able to use their hands and extend their arms full, uh, from the elbow. Quote, extending your elbow allows you to push your wheelchair better, helps you transfer in and out of a car, 
reach out to do something in space in front of you and shake a friend's hand. The team at Austin Health in Melbourne, Australia have been using, a com uh, have been using combinations of tendon transfers which result in greater strength for the muscle and nerve transfers which improve dexterity. Their findings from their work on 13 patients are reported in the Lancet Medical Journal, which is a very prestigious medical journal. Van Zyl says she hopes they, they will encourage the thousands of people who have become tetraplegic, also known as quadriplegic, um, by losing the function of all their four limbs to seek surgery which could help them live more normal lives. Holy moly, 10 years ago, they didn't think this was possible. 20 years ago, they believed it was not possible. 50 years ago, you, were, you had no hope. Here we are now in Melbourne, and yes, I am going to, I'm going to back Melbourne in this. I'm sorry to be patriotic. But here we are, Melbourne research team at Austin Health, giving quadriplegic patience a quality of life phenomenal absolutely phenomenal that is absolutely brilliant so you know car accidents where you've you know, severed your neck you know you've, you've severed the nerves in your neck now they're able to pull pull nerves from above that vertebrae down into the arms now the trick is though is the rehab takes a while, strengthening and conditioning and physio and other rehab activities. But last night on the news, I saw the fact of, it was either last night or Friday night, they were um, able to, okay, the, the, one of the patients still in a wheelchair could use his phone. He could send a text message, post to social media. He could even hold a can of beer. How's that? Talk about improving your quality of life absolutely brilliant brilliant bit of medical research and you can't deny that if you don't think that's a good thing there's a problem with you put it that way anyway now here's a case that's been dragging on for near over a decade now um and this is disgusting all right, now, I don't want to get myself into a slanging match over this, but I'm sorry, this is just absolutely poor form. I've got a lot to say about this too. And I'm going to read the full article on this. Melbourne hit-run driver Paneet seeks short-term sentence in exchange for a return from India. Paneet Paneet wants a maximum two-year jail term for a Melbourne crash that killed a young guy. The lawyer for hit-run driver Paneet Paneet, who killed a student in Melbourne in 2008 before fleeing to India, says his client would return to face justice if Victorian authorities guaranteed him a maximum two-year jail term. Speaking from Delhi, lawyer Singhale told the Herald Sun that Paneet was ready to face justice, quote unquote. Quote, let the government of Australia give us an offer that will that he will be sentenced to a maximum two years and surely and and surely of his safe life in jail, he will immediately surrender. Mr. Singhal said. Paneet fled Australia on a friend's passport after pleading guilty to culpable driving causing death of a student, De Dean Hofstey, in, in Melbourne in October 2008 while driving drunk at 150 k's an hour. He was in, arrested in India eight years later on his wedding day and has since attended dozens of extradition hearings to determine if he should be sent back to Australia. 
Mr. Singhal said Panit was concerned that he would not be given due justice, due, due justice in Australia and had been told in 2008 he would be given a sentence of 20 to 30 years. Even murderers don't get such a sentence, his lawyer said. In response to Mr. Singhal's request, Victorian Acting Attorney General Gavin Jennings told the Herald Sun that Victoria's courts would decide the appropriate punishment. Panit Panit needs to return to Victoria to face the consequences of his actions and, won't re and we won't rest until justice is served. Now, he's due to face court in Delhi again on July 15, just a couple of weeks away. During a court hearing last year, his lawyer argued Panit was not mentally competent to be the subject of an extradition decision when the defendant began making high-pitched noises and calling for his uncle. Judge Kerr stopped proceedings and said, what happened? Stand up, Panit, stand up, what happened? Panit, with a bandaged head, fell into his uncle's arms and began crying hysterically before he was removed from the courtroom. Judge Kuna asked, who was making those sounds? Was that him? Bashka Vali, the advocate for the Union of India, which handles extradition cases for the Indian government, said the defence argument about Panit's mental health was yet another uh, malicious application. The defence has previously argued Panit would face racism in Australia if extradition, if extradition, ex, sorry, would face racism in Australia if extradited, was gravely ill, was mentally unfit to face trial, and that the case was a, quote, political character. Okay, now look. I don't want to get into a slanging match over this. At all. All right, I don't want to get into a slinging match. But this guy's weak. Now, this is a twofold problem because the Australian authorities should never have let him out in the first place. That was the first problem. He should never have been allowed out of the country. He got out. He wants to make a mockery of the Victorian judicial system more than it already is more than it already is okay he wants to do two years jail now the rumor going around at the moment is he wants two years in a medium security prison so that would be something like marganite in lara i don't want to get into a slang and match but he does not want to return here based on racism, based on the fact that he doesn't think he's going to get a fair trial. Well, good God, you've killed someone. That's the first problem. The other problem is, is that our authorities made a mockery of this whole problem because they let him out. He should never have been able to escape. But, um, you know, he, he wants to come back here and face two years for culpable driving. So he goes and kills a guy, and you can see what's left of the car. He, he was drunk and speeding at 150 kilometres an hour. What's that? A little over 90 miles an hour. Well, 100, 160 k's an hour is about uh, is 100 miles an hour. So 150 k's an hour would be, what, about 88, 90 miles an hour maybe? Ninety miles an hour is about one hundred and fifty-four. So you're looking at about ninety-two, ninety-three mile an hour, give or take. Seeks short sentence in exchange for return from India. Unbelievable. You know that's just racism, and he's he he he's saying that it's political character. So. He's saying, all right, yes, I did kill someone, but you're just doing me over because I'm Indian. No, you, no, we're not. We're doing you over because you killed someone. We want you to come back here because you've actually killed someone. It's got nothing to do with race. You killed someone. You were drunk. You were speeding. You know, 
ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Um, I got, I got to say, I don't think he'll come back. I don't think he'll come back. I think he'll, 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 he'll do whatever he can do to stay over there, and he'll get away with it. The Victorian government, the taxpayers have already forked out a hell of a lot of money in this. And it'll probably come to a time where we'll just give up. We won't be able to get him back because he just he won't come back. Um, you know, it, it'll never happen ever. Um, so you know, it's a shame, but I I have to say I don't think I I see him coming back to Victoria to face justice. I really don't, to be honest. There we are. Fair bit in this week's weekly wrap-up. I will leave links in the description below for all the stories for you guys to go and read them individually. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday wherever you are around the world, and I'll catch you tonight for the Sunday edition of the Backyard Tech Channel livestream convos. Have a good one all. Cheers.